Alright. Uh, like is going to be on uh, hydrothermal vents. That's something that's come up recently as being a uh, origins of life on the planet Earth. Um, I've got some stuff to add to some of that hypothesis um, as far as that being a true origin of life on Earth as to why ET would have put that out there in, in the process of terraforming planets, it does have a single function. So, the, uh, know that if the carbonating is correct, if the Earth is supposed to be 3.5 million years old, and uh, that's if carbonating is correct, and most of its history was Venus. Um, And I've suggested in past uh, lectures is that Venus, uh, the Earth could have been moved. And the Earth originally uh, could have been where Venus is at, or it could have been somewhere else. But the ET does have the possibility of being able to move planets. There is something that they put at the center of the planet that they can utilize that can actually create distortions to actually move a planet. So it's not it's not like unlike possibility that ET doesn't have the ability to play pool out there and move planets. But there we go. They started they found those found the uh, the uh, Hydrothermal vents close to many continental ridges. So they're not on shore. Your continental ridges are usually like 300 miles offshore. And uh, I stopped putting my thinker together. I started thinking, well, why, why would ET put hydrothermal vents close to the shore? And I'm thinking in terms of a spacecraft that would come to Earth that they could utilize. And they want to be close to shore. Now, why do they want to be close to shore? Because they're they're in the process of terraforming planets. So uh, the earliest life on Earth is bacteria, and that's in here. It bacteria is something that they start spreading around out there close to the uh, the. Uh, they bring us to shore and stuff to create early life. We got a primordial soup out there, and now you have to create the biosphere and stuff. So the uh, you know they want to be some of the ridges are still, you know, 300 miles away from the, uh, the uh, from the shoreline. They want to be close to the continental rip close so they can act, have access out there. So we know that E.T. does walk upright. So we had a primordial soup out there and in the process of, of bioengineering, I mean, bioengineering a planet. So the uh, bacteria is our earliest form of life and we only can do produce bacteria in a laboratory. And if these birds, every one of these lectures is going to have something. <laughs> Didn't exactly right. All right, y'all shut up. All right, so get my parakeets to shut up. But anyways, the. Uh, You know, we can already edit by we can already edit uh, bacteria, so they can already do that in the laboratory. As far as uh, the who, the uh, genome project went out, and they can run the genome on bacteria and stuff. Well, it's a simple life form. It serves a very uh, important tool for uh, for uh, uh, terraforming planets, and it's something we can already do today in the laboratory. So it's already been proven that we can actually. They can actually edit bacteria and stuff and simple life forms there in the uh, in a laboratory. Uh, something else that is a possibility 
the trilobite is a uh, looks a lot like bacteria. It's one of the earliest forms of life. It was basically a pool sweep out there in the ocean and it would just go along the bottom and scavenge and stuff. And, you know, the, it looks a lot like bacteria. I mean, it's, it's round. It looks and it has feelers that walk around. That's very similar to bacteria. And it, can, it just crawls along the ocean floor. So, gives me clues at the possibility that whoever designed the bacteria was also the one that did to do the uh, pool sleep. And the only difference, one of the main things, it's, it's based on the same design, but the, one of the main difference is, is that it's a function, it's a, uh, it's got a chilatin uh, shell to protect it, and it's still got mobile feelers like bacteria, you can actually move and just Falls along the uh, along the uh, ocean floor. So I'll go for the clue that the creator of the trilobite was also the one who originally designed the original bacteria. Now, saying our radiocarbon dating is correct, the, the earliest fossils 3.5 million years old, and we call them peri peri-prokaryotic cells. The oldest fossils. And the eukaryotic cells are 2.1 million years old. And that's the origins of us. They're a little bit more complex uh, organisms. So there's a period where we just have bacteria out there. And then all of a sudden we have something arrives later on in the Earth's history. And you come, the more advanced form of the cells arrive. So obviously ET shows up again. Um, that there's a big time gap between the period of bacteria and the more advanced eukaryotic cells. So somebody out there, if the, if the carbonating is correct, isn't in a big hurry to create life on the planet Earth, but basically get it started. So it gives us clues. And, uh, you know, that's, that, that's what basically the information is telling us. Now, a lot of your, your evolution has come up with a common, last universal common answers, ancestor they call Luca. Of all life on Earth, which preceded the divergence of two prokaryotic domains. Um, and that these domains is where the origins of all of us. Um, but thing about advanced genetic engineering is that they all sit, all, everything on life on the planet Earth starts out as a single cell organism. There's no difference between us and plants. There's no difference between us and whales, dolphins, uh, birds, whatever. They all start out as a single cell organism. Now, that, uh, here again we have what we call the witch's ball. The witch's ball of life where all creation begins. So, the, uh, I don't think it's really any, 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 it's not a bacteria or it's, it, it, or it's a, just a simple life form of stuff that evolved into higher life forms. It's just a witch's ball. Take the concept that all life in the universe starts out as a witch's ball. And the creator or the great creator, which is E.T., advances that. So it's, you know, say that witchcraft, the craft doesn't have anything to do, it's just an old ancient uh, religion that we had back in barbarian Europe. Not true, it's what people believe out there in the universe. Uh, it just taught the barbarians back then. All right. So here's some of their theories, the similar similarities between present day archaea, which is us, and bacteria. Both domains have RNA and DNA, so we know they have the same design. Both domains codes for proteins which are synthesized on ribosomes. The basic process of transcription and translation are similar. That means you can set out there, ET can set out in a, in a shuttle of some kind, and program 
to what he needs. So we have still have a transcription process that is similar between the two of those. That's what the information tells us. A universal jet anatomic code translates a nucleic acid message to a protein. So here again, ET sitting in front of his computer three, what, let's see, 3.5 billion years ago, if, that, if the carbon dating is correct, and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, we're here to create bacteria and, and to uh, you know, start the process of life on the planet Earth. You know, but we're, you know, it's, we're only gonna, they're only going to spend some time out there, and it, you know, it, 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 they have a lot. To, it, the information tells me they have a lot of work. They're going to be visiting a lot of planets out there, and they, and and to start life on the planet Earth. But there's also a primordial suit that's out there already. So that means they didn't. They. Uh, that's another question mark. And I'm gonna, I, still, I do investigative research. I don't have an answer for that on yet. There's, there's a, been lab, lab experience, ex experience on that and what the primordial suit was for early life and how it got on the planet Earth because all you got out there to start out with is rock, you know, basically a large asteroid that's back to the ground just like the planet Earth. So you have to have that primordial soup out there too to begin life on the planet Earth. So it's a, it's a lot, it's a, it's a very complex process. It takes a lot of information. It isn't going to occur through evolution. And somebody has to eat the asteroid and build a planet Earth. And, and it takes a lot of information. All right, so both the names use ATP to provide energy for metabolic re reactions. Without ATP, you can't create the transitions. So we have a transition, which is ATV, which is provided is, is molecular energy to create that transcription process. You know, ET sitting in front of a computer has ATP, utilizes, has the ability to utilize ATP and create a molecular, a molecular process to create what, you, what they need out there. Both use similar protein synthesis to harness energy of a proton, integrate it, and generate ATP. So we know that, that ATP is also part of that single cell organism that can, it can actually be processed. Without it, you can't process the information. So ATP, they discovered, is necessary for life. You have to have a transcription, you have to have some kind of form of molecular energy or in chemical energy to, to, to transcribe an advanced life form. Otherwise, it can't be done. So it requires information. It brings up a point. This is coming out of a science journal that I'm utilizing. This will survive an EMP attack, uh, but a computer won't. So a lot of these are going on supermax computers and stuff are a memory disk that will not survive an EMP attack. So that's another problem this civilization has right now. If it comes to war again, all that information goes bye-bye. So ET doesn't go to war out there in the universe because it's the end. And everything that ETs learn, everything ETs, uh, there's limits to war. And you cannot do that at a certain point in time that's not a, that's not a, a, uh, a uh, option anymore. Because all that research, and this goes back, what, 5,000 years ago, all that research goes, that's it, you know. This will survive the EMP attack, but the, uh, the computers will not survive the EMP attack. And it takes a lot of information to build a terraform a planet. So, you know, how many planets out there, uh, civilizations ever got to the point to be able to do that? You know, that's one of the problems out there in the universe is a civilization has to survive. It has to be able to come to a point where they say, hey, this, this civilization is worth preserving and it has to survive. It can't be just based on being a Native American, grabbing your pole and waging war again. You have to have a come up with a formula for survival. 
Otherwise, we're just, if you've been watching the TV series naked and afraid, well, that could be a possibility. They came to a point, they were, uh, went to war again, they lost most of their technology and stuff, and maybe Star Trek sends them out to the planet Earth and beams them down, which is, I think is a distinct possibility, and all of a sudden they wake up and they have no clothes, they're in the Garden of Eden out there all along the River Nile, or they're in, uh, uh, up there in Syria, which is and up there in that part of the Middle East, where that's the origin of maybe possibly us, and that's still debatable as to what is our origins, because all of a sudden there's no lineage of history that shows pinpoints for life again, even, even King Manoa on an island. There's, we're missing, there's big gaps, there's a missing history out there, or a forbidden history. All you know is that we arrive on the planet Earth, they're naked and afraid, they have no memory of where they came from, and they have to put civilization back together again. Well, that's impossible because this is no longer around. And they're having to reinvent stone tools, they're having to reinvent just built, creating basic shelters, they don't have the ability to do that, and they're hovering around caves because they don't even know how to build uh, shelters. I mean, that's a sad reality. Um, you know, there's a forbidden, there's a hidden history back here that a lot of us that started these, you know, started these back with Madame Matoski, uh, the Thule Society, when people know the dark history of what that could have, that became, and it finally got, and, uh, and different places of history, people that start thinking in terms of, well, there's a hidden history out there, even in Egypt and stuff, that, that uh, has clues as to where we came from and, and what our origins are. But it took, it's taken a lot of time just to get to that point, even in today's times, of uh, years and years of research. But, anyway, so I'm off of, uh, uh, let's see. Okay, they tell you, uh, they, 1977 when they discovered the uh, hydrothermal vents, they sent Alvin down there and they, they had a lot more time. They started all these creating submarines and stuff that could actually go down there and they started having money, you know, a little bit of money that they could uh, start researching the ocean and stuff. They had the Katoso Society back in the 50s and I mean the 60s and the 70s and 80s. Um, they had some more better diving equipment. They had better started, you know, we, we had submersibles that you could use and stuff. So our knowledge of the ocean started getting more Get getting better. So, um, what they discovered out there at the hydrothermal vents, uh, the, the vents, the water surrounding the vents is 300 to 400 degrees Celsius. <coughs> so, it's, it's very warm. And let's think of that first. It's, 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 if you're ET and you come to the planet Earth and you got to do some work out there, high in the fertile vents could be a source of heat, you know. You don't want to freeze to death out there. And one of the problems with any kind of spaceship and stuff, you have to have backups. You, you can serve in the U.S. Navy, and whether you're in submarines or on aircraft carrier, you always have backups. That's even over at NASA if something breaks down. So you have to have a backup. Even in artificial gravity, any space-faring civilization has to have artificial gravity. If it goes out, you got to have a backup. Um, you know, so number one, it would supply heat. It's a source of heat. Uh, they can actually hook up to a thermal vent, and they can run it through a. Uh, I worked in heating air condition. They can run it through a condenser coil, like heat, like what we have today. I don't know what they would use, but I would suggest that. Just basic engineering and stuff would indicate to me that they can run that hydrothermal vent through a suction 
and then that can actually heat their spacecraft. So now they got they got a, a, a source of heat that they can use to warm their spacecraft out. So my suggestion is that's one of the uses of hydrothermal vents that ET what ET would use them for out there, and that's the reason why they're out there. So. Um, Here's another thing about that. It's laden with hydrogen sulfide and dissolved metals, but not hydrogen. But it does have dissolved metals that are, uh, are, that are pouring out of those. What can that be utilized for? Well, let's, th let's, let's think about it. Let's look at new technology that's come up. And let's say that, let's say that some of that technology could be used in the future by ET. There, better, there may be better versions of it, but there's it's technology that they could use in the future on a spaceship. Um, just like, because uh, we're getting to that point to where they were when they arrived uh, a long time ago. Um, some of the stuff that we have today's times. Uh, high definition TV is a good example of that. The only improvements I think that they could actually make on that is is uh, holograms. You know, they they've had the technology since the nineteen seventies, the hologram, but you, you can't you can't give it you can't have it a real three D effect on high definition TV. You get you get a two D effect, you get depth, and you get a good concentration of color and stuff. The only improvements you can make on that is holograms. So they may have been using holograms back then. I've put that in some of the art that I've been putting out by the lectures because I, I, I'm pretty sure that that's the next step, that that's possibly what they were using is holograms. That's the only step up from high definition TV. And on a Starship or something, you know, high definition TV screens may be what they had, you know. Because a hologram, especially on a control panel, are a are a uh, on a screen, a tactical screen and stuff. You wouldn't really put that in the holograms. It's just a basically a commu communication tool. So uh, they would have both. So, but the possibility also is is that e printers. E printers is a new technology that's come up pretty recently. I think in the '90s, and e print. Um, you can basically sit down in front of a computer screen, and I already talked about being able to create life and advanced genetic engineering. An alien can sit in front of a computer screen and e print anything he needs. Uh, so, then what do you think you're, you're let's say, you're, you're, you're 11 light years away from your base, and you know, you can't go back to your base if something breaks down. What does the alien do? Well, they, they e print. If they got a part or something they need to fix, they e-print it. There's probably higher technical versions of what we have today, but it still operates probably on the same principle. If you're an alien's technology, and, alien, and aliens are arriving for to do work on the planet Earth, they would have to have some kind of form of e-printer. They can, you know, just for about everything. Um, so. Uh, the possibility of what they could use hydrothermal events for is dissolved metals, and it be basically a backup of that suction cup that they put down on the hydrothermal vent sucks that metal up. The heat, they can put that in some kind of condenser, separate from the seawater, and they're using that to heat the spacecraft. But they could take that metal and they could burn it into an heat primer. So now they got a source of metal. If they need some kind of spare part or something to fix a ship or whatever they need, they they could utilize that. So that's a possibility also of what hydrothermal vents uh, could be used for. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking in terms of survival. How does ET think out there? And how does ET survive out there? There has to be stuff on the planet that you can actually utilize. You know, they're now. Talk about going to Mars and stuff, but you have to be able to use the natural resources of Mars as a backup just in case you can't return or they don't survive out there. You know, you have to look at what Mars' resources are. They're naturally, can you, can you use the rock out there? Can you, does there's metals out there they can use? Can, they, can you use that as a backup? Uh, so that, that's part of the project 
planning the project missions is you have to have backups out there or they, they don't survive. So that's one of my clues as I think is that's what auto thermomets can be used for. It's, it's, it's a backup. Here's a list, let me see. Okay, here's one of their theories. I'll go along with some of their theories, and this is oh, when this got this got put out in 2011. Okay, here's one of the so it's pretty pretty recent. One of the hypotheses: the first living cells are not hydrotrophic fermenters breaking down organic molecules that accumulated over millions of years, but instead were chemotrophos trophs capable of extracting energy from inorganic molecules released on hydrothermal vents. The high temperature of black smokers, so that's one of their hypotheses. And here's the uh, difficulty they have with this scenario is the high temperature of black smokers vents provide energy but reduce the stability of organic molecules. The vents, low pH limits the, the range of uh, possible chemical reactions. Organic molecules formed at best could would dissolve in the surrounding seawater, leading to dissolution, dilution rather than concentration. The short lifespan of black smoke at hydrothermal vents is a problem. These last only 10 to 100,000 years. They're not going to stay out there. I mean, it's, they, they left, they're out there for a while and they shut them down. Probably the reason why is because they don't, they have the, uh, you wouldn't want to keep them out. You want you wouldn't want to have them out there. Well, it's just like oil. You know, there's metal coming out of the hydrothermal vent, and you want to be able to utilize that for your backup. But if it stays out there, eventually it's going to run out. It's just like oil. It's a natural resource of the planet Earth, so that's going to be moved, and you have to know they're out there. Otherwise, uh, ET doesn't. Know, it can't survive out there. So the. Um, Something else so that, so also about that is that you can, the, the life forms out there, you can eat. I mean, there's two worms, giant clams, mussels, and eyeless shrimp. So all those are good, Dell. You can, you got a kitchen aboard your spaceship, you come down, and you got a source of food. So we know that if that's what ETs were using them for, we know that they eat food. They like shrimp, they like clams. And they can cook two worms, probably tastes like squid, but it's it's a good del delicacy, you know, and all that's seafood on a cruise ship. So if that if that's the reason why those are out there, ETs very similar uh, like the same things we do. So you know they they uh, that also you don't want those migrating away from the thermal vents because you want to keep them close to it so you can use them as food. So that's, you know, that's the else backs that, that information backs up as to my hypothesis of what those can be used for as far as what x would use them for. Uh, all right. Okay, the, the fluid rich, it's, it's very alkaline. And that's, that's generated from those hydrothermal vents. And it is, we know that chemical, alkaline creates chemical reactions. When it, you're transcribing life and stuff, you have to be able to create those chemical reactions. So, the hydrothermal the uh, the vent is, is pouring water into the spacecraft and the ET's describing uh, life from the planet it's going through there it's heating the spacecraft so we've got something that can heat the spacecraft we've got a supply of food and we, we got it's, we have the they have a uh, 
they also have the alkaline that's coming through that. And so, and where's all that going? Well, after it's transcribed, it gets pumped right back out of the spaceship. So that's building up in our primordial suit. We're having transcriptions going out one direction. It's heating the spacecraft, and it's going out out of the out into the ocean. So there's a process going out, and it just goes on and on and on and on, and it's building life on our primer in our uh, ocean. So that's what he, you know it's, it's a good it's a good source of uh, basic of survival for an extraterrestrials. You know. Including the planet Earth. That's what's going on during that time. That's also alkaline. So we know there's a chemical, we have a chemical agent we need to be able to describe to transcribe life. Because you can't do that. You can't change RNA and DNA to create advanced life forms without a, a chemical reaction. There has to be some kind of energy process like ATP or something to create that create that transcription. It can only be done by in a laboratory. They, they never, the evolution never, they, they, all they could do is extend the dating back to billions of years that it just happened by a natural process. But all that, they, 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 to try to prove that, they had to go to a laboratory to do it. And that's not evolution, that's design because it's seen done in a laboratory. Oh, let's see. about, I'm not going to get into really too much, I've really gone, I've gone off track a little bit, but um, anyways, I hope that in this lecture I've kind of shown you the possibilities of what's survival out there is, if you seem that good and afraid, well, that's not ET, but it could, you know, that, um, because we didn't know how to do any of that when we started, we just, all we did is hover around in caves and we, we know how to build basic shelters and we eventually learned how to farm and and hunt and build basic spears and stuff but that wasn't ET's world out there. ET had all the technology you needed to uh, start terraforming plants and stuff and that just was you know the, that wasn't that wasn't ET's world out there at that time. But uh, the, only the problem is, is that any kind of war and stuff, and you lose the information, and it's very hard to get back. So once you lose the information, guess what? <clears throat> Hi, I'm naked and afraid. And now we're just caveman again. Well. We're, the war is over with and we're just naked and afraid and I'll end this lecture.